All right. This is my oh, better a whole view. different perspective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um, I, I wanted to start with a question you've probably been asked a zillion times, but sort of an, for lack of a better phrase, an origin question, which is, and specifically Shaker origin, which is to say, Lisa gave a very abbreviated version, but how did you come to join this community? <laughs> I don't know, you've got enough time for the whole version. <laughs> uh, but, so I, Lisa said I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, and if you know anything about the geography of right, where that is, it's right on the border with Connecticut. And that's an important part of this whole story. Because my grandmother, uh, my father's mother, uh, was a very short, fat French woman who loved, <laughs> she earned her fat very righteously by loving food as much as anything she ever loved in life. And Graham not only talked about food, but she ate food while she was talking about food. <laughs> and How is this going to get us to joining the Shaker community? Oh, because Graham's, the, Graham's <laughs> part of it. Graham's the foundation of it, actually. Right. <laughs> so when my grandmother was young, they used to run a train on Friday nights down to Enfield, Connecticut, right to the Shaker community. And they had chicken dinners. <laughs> Fast forward to the 1960s. <laughs> And those tedious summer rides that one had to endure as a child. Um, and if you behaved yourself, you would get ice cream at the end, right? So we would often go into Enfield because it was still rural. Now, it had been sold to the state of Connecticut as a prison farm. But it was wholly a farm at that time. Huh. And they used to provide all the dairy products for the prison system in Connecticut. So they had probably 200, 300 head of cattle. And they had a big farm. And so we'd go through and Graham would always talk about it. And she also would talk about Brother Ricardo Belden, who Graham had not such a secret crush on. Um, <laughs> Ricardo, Ricardo had left the community. He had had an argument at some point, And another brother left with him. And they lived in Springfield right next to my grandparents when they were first married. And somewhere in the family, there's a picture of my father being held by Brother Ricardo. So that's all I really knew about the huh. Shakers. But that was a story I heard ad nauseum for, for <laughs> years and years and years. So my parents were very historically minded. And for I'm the oldest of three. And for our birthdays, we would do something historical. We would do the Boston Freedom Trail. We would do Old Deerfield. We would do Mystic. We would do Sturge, anything in the world that had to do with history. And this year was my brother's birthday. And we went to the, the restoration at uh, Hancock Shaker Village uh, outside of Pittsfield, Mass. And we had a tour. I was 16, and I was really taken at that time period by the whole concept of communal living. Huh. And I learned so much about the Shakers, I knew nothing about it. And I, it was just an eye-opening thing. But the tour guide said one thing about Brother Ricardo, because he was the last male at Hancock. And she said that he was a lifelong Shaker. So the tour was over, I went up to her and I said, thank you, you've really opened my eyes, I knew nothing about this. But I said, there's one thing I do know, is that he was not a lifelong Shaker. That he had left the community for about 15 years, and he lived next door to my grandparents. And she said, you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Those are all people who know me who are laughing. Uh, so I have, I have many, many faults. And I freely admit to those. But the greatest fault I've always had was, if I'm right, please don't tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> and when I was 16, there was no please. So I went back out. I was so furious that I was being dismissed because I was only 16. And I went out into the reception center, and they had this huge map of the Shaker world. And it showed two communities were still extant. One was in New Hampshire, one was Maine. I never liked the state of New Hampshire. And I have strong <laughs> ties to the state of Maine. My father's sister lived there, lived here in Brunswick, and we came every year once a year. Plus, my mother's family was actually from Maine, too. So I, no question. I went home. I typed up. Uh, Brother Ricardo Belden, born, joined, left. Rejoined, died. Self-addressed self stamped envelope, sent it in, waited for a reply, and I was going back to Hancock. And I was going to say, see, I'm right and you're wrong. Well, I didn't get, this, I didn't get it back. I got this long letter back instead. And it was styled uh, Brother Theodore E. Johnson. And Brother, <coughs> excuse me, Brother Ted really claimed in that that the, Brother Ricardo was the first shaker he ever met. And he was interested in, in the Shakers in the 1950s. And Ricardo said, Hancock is over. If you really have an interest, you need to go to Maine. And he followed his advice. And as that, 
he, he was the impetus for why he joined. So he had a very strong connection and love for Brother Ricardo. And suddenly I could care less about Hancock. And all I wanted to do was to find out more about Shakerism because that would have been 1972. There was like nothing that you could read about present day Shakerism. And so you could read about anything the Shakers did up until 1850, but the historians weren't interested in anything after that. So I started writing. And I'd ask all these questions, I'd get all these answers. I'd ask all these questions, I'd get all these answers. And I always say, Brother Ted was sick and tired of dealing with me. So he just said, well, why don't you just come up and see? <laughs> so on were you, the- Were you asking spiritual questions? Were you asking sort of history questions? I asked everything. <laughs> I, I wanted to know, well, you know, the Shakers were very progressive, but well, they didn't have to still be. So the first thing you ask, well, well, do you have electricity? No, I mean, really, you don't know because there was just absolutely nothing out there. And so I did those kinds of things and then I did ask religious questions and about how, the, uh, how Shakerism actually functioned today, et cetera. And so I went the day after Thanksgiving in 1975 for a three-day weekend. Did, did you feel like you were an unusual 16-year-old? <laughs> and how much younger were you at the time than the other members? Was the community already sort of aging, or were there other young? Oh well, well Stephen Foster was living there, and he 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 was my age. Yeah. And there were lots of young people around who were interested in inquiring into the life, but the members themselves were all. Well, the youngest one was Brother Ted, and he was as old as my father. And how did you get them from there to? That still seems a, a, a long journey from visiting and being sort of an inquisitive teen to saying, I'm going to join this community. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was told that. So in summer, of, I was told that by Brother Ted. In 1977, I had been visiting on and off. Well, my first visit changed my life, absolutely. I didn't intend to be a shaker yeah. from it, though. But I had never been in a strange place that was at home, and I would never met strangers who were like family. Huh. So on Sunday after meeting, when time to leave, I said, when can I come back? And Sabbath Day Lake was desperately poor in those days. And <clears throat> so volunteers and anything else was so much needed and, and desired. So I started coming and visiting and giving all of my time and anything I could possibly do for them. And in the summer of 77, I was there the whole summer, really. And as I was winding down, Brother Ted said, child, we need to have a serious, mature adult conversation. It was one of his key phrases. How old were you at the time? Uh, I was 17, but I was good. I mean, I was, wait a minute, how old was I? 19. Okay. No, 20. 20. I was going to turn 21 in October. Yeah. This was in August. And he said, we, we have to have a conversation. And so, anyways, we did. And he was telling me that I needed to be a shaker. And I said, nay, I don't. I said, I like this relationship just the way it is. It's working out fine for me. And he said, nay, it isn't. And I said, it is. <laughs> and he said, nay, it isn't. You are not following your heart. You have a calling to be here. And I said, nay, I don't. I mean, I do, but not, not to be a shaker. Yeah. And so anyways, two or three other conversations ensued during that week. But it wasn't, it wasn't the conversations themselves. It was the 6th of August. That's the day that the Shakers arrived in America in 1774. And it's one of the holiest days we have of the year. So we always have this meeting at nighttime, which is just, well, the whole scene gets bright anyways, because you're in the meeting house, you're having to use kerosene lanterns. And mm -hmm. we had a lot of people, and it was just the most spirited meeting I have ever been in. So it was during that time, and I just said, uh oh, you're right. <laughs> and so the next day I went to Brother Ted and said, okay. What do I do? And so the community uh, met together and decided that um, I was worthy of a, a chance. So I went back to Massachusetts, and it took me a lot longer to settle up affairs, but I didn't get back until January, uh, January 19th. What did your family think? <laughs> that was part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> they didn't think much of it. It wasn't like they didn't see it coming, but it wasn't what they wanted. Yeah. What my, did they want? Oh, my... Oh. They wanted me to be successful and give them grandchildren. A leap ahead. That was, that was never going to happen. <laughs> so my father didn't speak to me for seven years after I joined the community. And did that give you pause and think I'm not doing the right thing? 
Absolutely not. Yeah. Mm -mm. And just since you speak about grandchildren, I mean, when you join, do you, I, I would think there's things you're giving up that maybe are worldly things, like I don't know if you have give up your possessions or give up, but, but also just things like the possibility of having a family or maybe of traveling or of having a career or all the things that we think of as very normal, um, normal ambitions. How, I mean. I never had those ambitions. Hmm. And, and then I'll ask you, speaking then as a 20-year-old and today, did you, I mean, did you even understand sort of what you were giving up? And do you, do you feel differently about oh, it today? Well, I, or did it not feel like giving up? I shouldn't even use that phrase. No, it was giving up. Definitely there was giving up. The sacrifice, I mean, the whole life is about sacrifice, really. Yeah. Uh, and I thought I was very ready for it. Because, of course, when you're 21, you know everything. Right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's true. But, I, I mean, I didn't know anything. And that, that became apparent to me very early on. But the giving up, no, it's not, it's not as dramatic as you think it is. It's, it's pretty easy, really, not to own anything. It's very easy. Uh, we don't own anything, but we all own everything together. Yeah. Um, we do that. The whole life of, of a shaker is to live the life of Christ. That's why we're celibate. Uh, we recognize it's a calling, and it's not something meant for everybody. But if it's meant for you, then it's meant for you. And the idea of living together as Christ lived with his disciples is there you are building yourselves. And the reason my title is brother is because we're, rep we're recognizing a new relationship in Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. So we are all brothers and sisters. Right. And in that, we are this new Christ family. And so we're here to support each other, to love each other, to care for each other. The greatest thing about our life is our community. The worst thing about our life is the community. <laughs> and that's the truth. Because you're put in with all these people who you had nothing in common with necessarily, no common backgrounds, no common shared experiences, perhaps even goals. Because everybody hears the voice of God in a different way. Yeah. And it calls them differently and for different reasons. And so you're called to love those people without boundary. And to just do what you're supposed to do in that love that God has shown you. And that's the challenge of our, that is probably the greatest challenge of our life. So more of a challenge than giving up the idea of, you know, a trip to France or becoming a doctor or um, well, that's your calling, having that's, children. Right. If that's your calling, that's your calling. But, I mean, you come into it. It's not like we hide celibacy as sort of a, you know, yes, come on in. celibacy. And, oh, yeah, wait a minute. We're celibate. <laughs> right. You know, and that, that's sort of, it's sort of out Forgot there. to say. Forgot to tell you that part. <laughs> Actually, that did happen. There was a revival <laughs> in Sweden back in the 1850s. And um, it was very Shaker-like. And the Shakers heard about it, and they sent somebody over. And they had like 60 people come from Sweden to join oh. them. And they didn't bother to tell them that they were celibates. <laughs> How'd that work out? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I'm returning to that again, but this is probably a question. And I, it's, you know, it, it seems like maybe it would be easier to give up when you're the age you are now at a, for a 20-year-old boy to say, or young man to say, I will be celibate, seems, um, just seems incredibly challenging. Well, obedience is a lot more challenging. Hmm. So Thomas Merton said, uh, poverty, that's a cinch, chastity, well, that takes getting used to, but it can be managed. Obedience, that's the bugger. Hmm. And that's really what it is. When you know you're having to, by living this life, you're giving up your free will in the sense of you, have, you are being led. You're being told where your position is, what your job's going to be, right. where you're expected to be. And that's, that's actually the big, big challenge. Huh. And does that mean obedience to the other people in the community or well, obedience to, to Christ? Both. Yeah. Christ and your elders as well. But so, right, so I mean, I was, I was a city boy. What do I know about sheep? <laughs> First thing I was done, I, I was just given the, given the sheep. Go ahead. No instruction, just there they are. Mm-hmm. Huh. <laughs> Why would they not give you something that you knew how to do? Because they needed somebody to look over the sheep because Stephen Foster had left. <laughs> 
Did you ever, uh, the sheep maybe is a small thing, but what, I mean, did, was your faith ever shaken? Did you ever Of think course. You've been there for 40? Almost 42 years. 42 another years. Month. So yeah, are there Two moments where you life. just thought, what am I doing? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I think if you're not questioning your faith, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. If you're that complacent, that means you're not, you're not in the work. And is it, is it some big crisis that sets it? What, I mean, would, would it be set off by being presented with a job looking after sheep? You know, what, would set it, what would set off a crisis of faith? Personality. 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 Mm -hmm. So someone difficult in the community that you need to be a brother to. Or feeling that you're not, you're not being, that there's different sets of rules for different people. Huh. So, so um, I'll give you, I want to, yes, I'm give me an give example. All right. Terrible, terrible problem with one person in particular. And I really had had it. I mean, totally had it. And I just, I went to Brother Ted and said, I said, I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't stand him. I can't live with him. I don't want to be with him. And so I said, I really don't see any other choice but to leave because he's not going to leave. Right. Brother Ted sent me down, and he said the most profound thing I think anybody ever told me, which was to say, you, you looking at this all wrong. You don't have to like him. You don't have to like anybody, but you just have to love him, and you have to love everybody. And we get these things mixed up in our minds, and it's very easy to think that liking is more important than loving, and loving is whatever it is, part of the liking. Not at all. It's very different. So... Huh. And did that did that resonate right away, or did it take right you a away. long time to right away? Mm -hmm. But it took me decades to make it work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> now the community is very tiny. So is the community part of it suddenly simple? No, not at all. People are people. Situations are situations, and we have as many, we have more challenges, I would tell you, than less, because there's fewer people to take care of those things. Yeah. So, it, speaking of which, I know you have, a, you have a new brother who has just joined. Right. Well, a year. A year? How does, how does one join? I mean, do you so, proselytize? Do you put out, you know, put an ad <laughs> well, out? Well, you, know, you know, people always say to me, why aren't you out proselytizing? I said, well, you know, it's a little different. You know, I mean, like, these new churches can come and say, well, you know, join us for Sunday. We knock on your door and say, hey, go give everything you own. Give it to the poor. Come follow us and give everything to us. You know? It's not so easy. It's a hard sell. It's not so easy. <laughs> and by sell. the way, we're celibate. Oh, yeah. Well, we should add that to <laughs> And by the way. Uh, so people write us. They find out about us some way or another. Uh, there's a lot of things written about us and a website and everything else that might draw them to us. And so nowadays it's mostly emails we get, but we do get some letters too. And we just tell them the process, uh, the qualifications for joining and the process of joining and what it takes. And, you know, nine out of ten times you won't hear from them again. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with people want things instantaneously. Hmm. And uh, the, this work, Mother Ann told us that this, the work of the gospel is not the work of a day, a week, a month, or even so a year, but it's the even so the work of an entire lifetime. And that's how it is. So first of all, you have to be between the ages of, of 21 and 50. You have to be in good health and mental health, free of debt, no encumbrances such as marriage or dependence, uh, so that you'd be free to give yourself to the community and to God. Then if you meet that, we ask, well, why do you think God's called you to be a shaker? and write it back and forth, and if that looks reasonable, you're invited to come for a visit. And we expect people to visit for at least a year on and off uh, before we would feel free to then go that next step of having them join for a novitiate, which is a, a year's probation period. Yep. And then it's a total of five years in community, and then you would be a full or church member. It's at that time at, when you come to the final part that uh, anything you owned would be then turned over to the church. And um, when you were young, did you think that the community, I mean, it's, it's, it's been getting smaller. Did you think, obviously for more than a century, but did you feel like that was going to continue to be the trend? Or did you think that one day you would be one of two or three? I never thought that was going to happen. No, but it did happen. But I didn't, that wasn't my vision. When I joined, I thought 
there was so much interest going on that I thought that we were going to have to divide the property and found another family within the community to, to accept all the people that were coming. Hmm. And there have been tons of people who have come. Yeah. They just haven't stayed. Yeah. Um. Sorry. Got completely out of order here. Um. I, I guess we, you touched on this a little bit, but and I realize this could be a discussion of, um, you know, could be a whole semester-long class, but maybe just briefly tell us what Shakers believe. Well, I, I think we sum it up two ways, really. Uh, number one, it's to live the life of Christ. That's why Mother Anne was preaching and lived, was to live an authentic life of Christ. So it, it is celibate, and it is communal, and it is... Um, for equality of all. And so we, we call it the three C's. Confession of sin, which is the entryway to the church. Community of goods. So we all own everything together, but nobody owns anything. Mm -hmm. And celibacy. Um, and, I mean, if you were, well, let's, let's skip that. Um. <laughs> well, also, also, we believe in the equality of all people. And... Where the Shakers got themselves in trouble to begin with was not, believe it or not, racial. It was gender, because the Shakers always had women equal with men. And we've always run our lives equal. Um, that the sisters always took care of the sisters' needs, the brothers' the brothers' needs, so they all were independent that way, and all had an equal say. And then, later on, close to the Civil War, uh, the Shakers started getting in trouble for having people that, who were not white living with people who were white on an equal Basis. Wow, interesting. Um, and I, I feel like I remember reading that at some point they were in trouble for taking in children. Because oh, I was just on. interested to hear you say that you, you can't, if you have dependents, you can't join well, today. Today. Well, yay, no. But uh, the communities were founded by entire family units right. joining, and they were usually large families, eight to ten kids uh, with the parents. And they wouldn't be divorced so long as both parents stayed in, stayed in the community. There was no need to, but they just separated. Yeah. Like brothers and sisters, and the children were divided up in the orders. But then in the 1820s, what started happening was uh, the, all those children were gone. They had all grown up, and either they had left the community when they came to the majority, or they were now the adults running the community. So they started feeling a need of fresh blood. And they were tired of going out on missionary tours, basically, preaching to adults, and so they had this feeling that if they were bring children up, that they would stay and make shakers. Right. It didn't really work, but they never stopped doing it, and they continued to do it at Sabbath Day late till the 1960s to take in kids. Huh. And why did they stop? Because it didn't work? Oh, it, never that simple. Now, the last caretaker, she um, got um, Parkinson's disease, and there was nobody else to take over the kids. And it started to become very difficult for us to get children anyways um, because they saw the Shakers as an orphanage and they were trying to get rid of all those kinds of things, place people in nuclear families and, you know, something more traditional. Yeah. Um, it, I was asking you about there being, so now there are three Shakers in the world. It's, uh, there's, it's in, right. three living Shakers in the entire world. What, does that feel like a, a really heavy responsibility? No. You know, one thing that Brother Andrew said, and he said it very consistently since he's joined, he says, I'm just one, I'm just the first one of many that are coming. And he believes that with us all his heart, which I have always believed that there will always be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we live faithful and true to what we have professed, we'll always have people who will join. Will we be a great or a large community? Nay. But I mean, there will always be a sustainable community at Sabbath Day Lake. Brother Andrew is the new... The newest member. Right, sorry. Yep. Um, we have a song. And it says, God's work will stand. It cannot, will not fail. It is founded upon eternal truths, enduring as the heavens are. It cannot, must not fail. And I think that sums up my feelings about the future. No, we can't, we can't tell what's going to happen or not going to happen. Uh, and I do not have an insight into the divine will and mind of God. But I do believe, and I've always had this intuition, that it's always going to continue. So you, so, yeah. I'm not worried. 
But what's the point of worrying anyways? Where does that get you? Right. <laughs> um, sorry. I wondered also... We're going past a lot of questions. Yes, because uh, tell, just tell me about a typical day. Actually, Yours? well, I'll start with saying in Lisa's introduction, she mentioned you'd been a, it's a long list of things. Um, uh, an author, an elder, a uh, baker, a cook. Uh, um, uh, I'm forgetting some of them, but obviously a sheep herdsman. And so I, what is a day like? The sun rises whether you see it or not. <laughs> sun sets whether you see it or not. And everything else in between is pretty much up in the air. We do have a... Uh, shaker order is very, very important. So our life is regulated by certain things which is to say it's punctuated by when we get up, when we pray, when we go to bed, and when we eat. So I get up uh, usually 6 o'clock in the morning because I'm the cook. So then I have to cook and I have to get going on dinner too. We, have, we always eat together and always have. So we have breakfast at 7.30 followed by communal prayers. I should have said whenever we rise, we all say our prayers privately in our rooms first. Mm -hmm. But then we have communal prayers at eight, approximately 8 o'clock. Then we go to our work. And um, for like Brother Andrew, he's taken on the duties of house cleaning in the dwelling house. He washes all the dishes from the meals too. Then we go to the barn at 9 o'clock and do chores and then come back and finish on the uh, kitchen work and try to do some business work upstairs as well. We meet again at 11.30 and we have prayers. And then we have dinner, which is our main meal at noon. Then we go back to our work and we, go, we do barn chores at 4 o'clock. And we have supper at 5.30. And then the evening is opened up for many different things. I mean, lately, of course, it's been for preparations of the Christmas fair. So our evenings okay. have been filled with that. And now we have Christmas giving things that we have to do, too. But normally, it's a, a free night to uh, do as you want. We, we do take newspapers. And we have a television and journals and things like that. If you want to sit there, if you've got work to do, do work. And... At times, whenever you want to go, really, whenever you need to. Wednesday night meeting, we also have, Wednesday nights at 5 o'clock, we also have a meeting. And Sundays is the day we try to have no unnecessary work mm -hmm. and to honor the Sabbath. And we have public meeting at 10 a.m., and that usually lasts about an hour. And that everyone, that's the one meeting of the, or the religious service of the week that's open to anybody who wishes to come. And we usually get, well, we had 31 people in meeting as visitors this last Sunday. But it fluctuates. You never know how many are going to come. Yeah. You were saying before we got on stage, we were talking, you were talking about how, what a busy day you'd had today and that you, you know, a lot of things happened and you hadn't been able to get this done and that done. And I was thinking that in my, you know, sort of seventh grade notion of Shakerism, I imagine it being just tranquil and peaceful. <laughs> and partly maybe because when you go to the Sabbath day lake, the, the, the village, it's just so beautiful and the, you know, sort of the strong imagery all over America about the beautiful, simple lines and the clean furniture. And it sounds, is, is, are your days all peaceful and tranquil? <laughs> I don't know that I've had a peaceful, tranquil day in my nearly 42 years. But, you know, I think that there, there's a validity to that concept and that notion when the community was large enough to be able to take care of everything it needed to take care of. Nobody overworked, really. They, they worked, everybody worked, yeah. but nobody overworked in those days because they didn't have to wear many hats. They, right. they had a regulated life, and they knew where they were going to be, what they had to do, and they did it. And then they had just this life that went on very, very tranquil. And one of the things that people in the 19th century always comment on is the, the profound silence of the Shaker life. And when I first went to Sabbath Day Lake, I can tell you that it was still a very profound silence. Hmm. Like, we weren't allowed to talk in the hallways. And uh, you just talked in the rooms. Yeah. And we didn't even talk at table, I mean, at our mealtime until the 60s. What was the reasoning for that? Brother Delmer died. <laughs> Not the answer I expected. <laughs> the sisters had been chafing at the bit for 
long time to be able to just talk and do what they wanted to do. And Brother Delmer was an old time shaker. We would have none of it. Right. None of it at all. And when he went, then that that aspect of it went. Huh. <laughs> and do you miss? Well, you weren't there then. I wasn't there then. I was going to say, would the quiet have been part of the appeal? Hmm. It gets pretty noisy sometimes in our dining room now. <laughs> um, it's a profound difference, like when we don't have company. Yeah. It's it's quiet. I mean, we, we may talk a little bit, but we don't talk very much, and we just get through. It's amazing. We get through our meal in less time than it takes to prepare it then, and we have prayers at, like, when we're usually starting breakfast. So. Right. Um, in, in, in all these roles you've had over the years as, you know, gardener, um, trustee, historian, is, is one of those roles more important to you than... Than another role, or do you see what was, yourself? You mean what was my mo most favorite job? Wow! All right, that's us. Sure. What was yeah, your I most mean, favorite? I mean, that's what you want. I mean, I'll tell you what I'm going to say, anyways. <laughs> um, I think my my favorite times were when Brother Ted was alive, and I was his assistant, and it was a time of research in the archives, uh, and I love our archives. Yep. Most of, most yep. of all. What were you researching? Everything. Brother Ted was never satisfied. He. He, no matter how much he knew, he needed to know more. And so he was insatiable about learning, and he would keep all of us busy on projects here and projects there, things he'd hear about and want to know more about. And specifically about Shaker history? Yeah. Yeah. And did you, you one, of the, one of the terms in your bio is author. What have you, have you written about the history of the Shakers, or what have you written? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you straighten up that problem with brother, I'm spacing on his name, who lived next to your grandmother? A brother Ricardo? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't, really re I haven't really researched brother Ricardo. I know about him. I yeah. know enough about him. I don't need to know much more. All right. Um, I, I visited um, your community several times, and each time I've been really surprised. I think one of the surprise, I'm sort of repeating myself, but is that I had this image of the village sort of preserved in amber from, you know, maybe 1870. But, you know, we, we had a whole discussion about making pizza and cooking grilled cheese. And um, uh, Sister June, when I was there, was reading a biography of Queen Elizabeth I that happens to be a book I love. Um, and I just found all kinds of things that surprised me, and I wonder what you think it might surprise people here to learn um, about the Shaker community that might be different from their image of it. I don't know. Did what surprise... You stumped me. I don't know. <laughs> Did did anything in the forty, you know, from the from the novish, you know, the the young shaker at twenty one who thought he knew everything, to what what has surprised you in your life there? Well, there's a lot of things that surprise me, I think. But one thing that continues to annoy me, <laughs> surprise me, is how little people get it about shakerism, that they continue not to get it. What would you? That have it's a living, breathing faith. Uh, no, and, and, right. and Shakerism, right. Elder Frederick Evans, who is not a person who I have a great deal of affection for, but he said but something. But you love him. Of course I love him. He was my brother a <laughs> hundred years before I was born. But he, uh, he said there's nothing more ugly than a fossilized Shaker. Hmm. That Shakerism is always, the, the uniqueness of Shakerism is that it has always been able to evolve and to progress and to adapt to the situations that are at hand. And as such, that, that is something of the glory of the church, that it is not stuck in. And Shakers don't have a creed. We've always, always adamantly denied a creed to come in. So there's no litmus test. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting that you, I mean, because I don't know how to say this without sounding rude, but from the outside it's world, it. You might say, "Oh well, it it is it isn't it hasn't evolved enough, or there would be you know hundreds of members or thousands of members." There wouldn't be shakers, would they? Shakerism requires sacrifice. I mean, that's the whole thing. The cross, the life of Christ is not an easy Christ yeah. life. Christ did not promise us anything good in this life whatsoever. 
And we've proven that's true. <laughs> we haven't. It's a good life. It is a good life. It's a, Sister Elizabeth used to say, it's a good life if you don't weaken. And even if you weaken, it's okay. <laughs> And why, what was it about Shakerism? Like, they're, they're communal lives of different sorts. You probably could have, you know, I'm sure there's groups of monks, and you, there were other, what was it I'm in particular about? I'm a Protestant. I'm not Catholic. <laughs> I'm not Orthodox. Yeah. So really, Protestants don't have a heck of a lot to choose from huh. when it's all said and done. Huh. But I think that what attracted me in Shakerism, though, was... No, I went to meeting. I'd never been to anything like that before. I, I was raised a Methodist, and I was a very loyal and very much believing in, in, in Methodism, of which Shakerism came out of. Uh, but I think what I found was the spirit was there, mm -hmm. and it drew me in immediately. I think that the equality in the whole running of the church, which was apparent um, and, and made very concrete to me from very early times on. I think all of those things attracted me as part of an emanation of our theology and our philosophy. And I saw Shakerism being lived seven days a week. Hmm. Maybe not being lived well necessarily, but being lived. Right. And being that we make mistakes and we fall and we, we sin and whatever it is. But in Shakerism we're told, stand up and try it all over again. And that's what we do. So that's the step-by-step -step progression that we try to make every day of our lives. And sometimes it is a joy, and sometimes it isn't. And it's like everybody else. Right. So the vocations get tested, and people get cranky, and people leave. Um, sometimes people come in, and they're not angels, but they demand you to be an angel for them. And when they find out you're just as human as they are, they lose their faith and go. Uh, it's just human nature. Um, what, how, you know, in, in greater society, we talk all the time about how the digital age has sort of revolutionized everything, that we're all on our phones and computers and whatever. Has that, does that um, affect the Shaker community? And how? Well, when computers were still very young, Brother Ted embraced the technology and immediately paid to have all of our staff go and take computer lessons so that they would know what to do. Hmm. Although it baffled him. <laughs> but <laughs> he, wanted, he wanted us to keep up with things. So, um, and actually I think it's in the archives, we still have our original computer, uh, which Wayne wanted to throw out and got rescued because it seemed to be important that we should keep that huh. somehow. So we still have it. but. Um, we try to progress with the times. We, we're not consumers, though. That's yeah. the one thing we try not to be. So we look at things, do we need it? Is this going to improve our life? Mm -hmm. Then we do it. And if it isn't, then we don't. Um, I have a cell phone, and I... Brother Andrew gave his up when he came and wants nothing to do with him and is very happy to be free. And he's right, he's free. Um, I was saddled with this by Sister Frances because she couldn't <laughs> find me. <laughs> Sounds like you're out in the world like everybody else, then. <laughs> no, I was just in another part of the building. <laughs> so, and God love her. Sister Frances um, got dementia. And um, the last few years were really, really hard uh -huh. for her and us. But just two days before she passed from us, as we were saying goodnight, she said, my cell phone number, out loud. That to her was her security blanket. If she knew that number, she knew where I was. Right. And she wouldn't be alone, and she wouldn't be lost. Right. So, and I, I still, it's, it's a 10-year-old slide phone. I mm -hmm. refuse to get an iPhone. And this is about to become obsolete, so maybe that's the time when I get rid of it altogether. Yeah. I don't like it, because it's demanding. It, people want it, they, they it's not your schedule, it's their schedule. Right. They demand an instantaneous answer, and you don't get it, and they're all upset. It says, no regulation in my life. And um, so it kind of, they kind of, they're necessary for some things, like when we're away, to be able to contact home and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. But otherwise, I think it's just a burden. Hmm. Um, when you were saying that if uh, shakers decide is something necessary, we're not you're not just consuming things, but are there arguments over that? 
Like it's a, it's not necessarily an easy question. Is it necessary? I no, I wouldn't say there are arguments. I don't. I don't even think there are even lively discussions over that. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> you know, some somebody may say, well, I don't see why we have to have it, and if it's explained, then that's fine. So. Um, and you also were talking about um, meeting. Is, especially the first meeting you went to where you felt like, oh, this is my community. What happens in a meeting? Uh, so Sunday meeting, which is different from our other prayer things during the week, it opens up with the reading of a psalm, and Sister June does that. And then we do an opening hymn. We have some published music uh, so that people, whoever's joining us, can, if you can read music or you can just listen to the tunes, you can get it. But you can join in and sing. Then we do um, Old Testament epistle and gospel readings. Mm -hmm. Then we do a second set song. And then the meeting is open to the moving of the spirit. So my job is to say welcome to everybody and, and uh, to let them know that they're free to participate either in song or in testimony as the spirit may lead them. That our founder mother Anne said a strange gift never came from God, so please don't feel strange or a stranger. And then it goes through testimonies and songs. And the songs are pitched up as an amen. So there are 10,000 Shaker songs. And I know of which we all know this. one. Yeah, I know. You only know that one. But, <laughs> but it anyways, is a beautiful one. It is beautiful. We've got many more, more beautiful songs. But uh, so you may be speaking, I don't know what you're going to speak on, like say love. And so somebody will be sitting there and they'll think of the song about love that seems to be apropos and they'll pitch it up when you're done. And then everybody who knows the song sings it with with as one, and that's how it goes on, on and off uh, for the time when it seems like the spirit's left and there's nothing more to say, and we just close it with prayer. Hmm. So there's not like a set meeting time is over at 11? Nay. Nay, meeting went on to almost 11.30, uh, actually on Sunday. <laughs> I'll just ask you about nay. How did, did you grow up saying nay and yay? What do you think? <laughs> I'm gonna go with nay. I did not. <laughs> That's shaker parlance. And let me tell you something. When I came to the community, if you started saying yes and no, you'd be spoken to. Really? And you actually you fit into it very easily because that's all you ever heard. Yeah. The only time is like when you'd be away from the community for a week or something like that, and you'd start slipping back into yes and no because you're just not, it's not being reinforced in you. Right. But. And Sister June said that when she first came to the community, you had particular things that you wore. Is that still the case, that there's a certain, you know, Oh, the uniform? Clothing. Yes, exactly. Sure. She, but she, uh, by the time Sister June came, they were only wearing it on Sundays and when you go out to, oh. to represent the community. Yeah. This. Is, for so, me. Not for her, but for me. Right. What would you be wearing if you were at home tonight? Uh, a flannel shirt <laughs> and lined, lined pants. All right. I, I think I have to end here. I was going to end by asking you, because I'm in a business where um, there's a lot of dire news in newspapers, um, and it never seems to go, you know, it, the news often seems to go this direction. And I was sort of going to ask you how you remain hopeful, but in a way I think maybe you've answered that for us. Because no. hope is always there. The first Sunday of, of Advent is hope. That's where we begin. Our hope is an aspiration. It's a desire, it's a longing for that which is going to come, right? And so we have to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And the hope is where it begins. That's really where faith begins, our hope. And then faith gets put into action, and action produces results. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we're going <laughs> to... I'll hold, we can hold on to that. Good. I think we're going to, we have a few minutes, 15 minutes, to take questions from the audience. So I think Molly has a microphone. I have this microphone, and I'd ask it, uh, raise your hand, and I'll come bring it to you for you to ask a question. And this helps everybody here. Um, and there's someone up in the balcony, so I'll get up there at the uh, end. Uh, All right, I'll, <laughs> I'll have the balcony project, please. Um, you have a, it's okay if I go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You have an extensive apple orchard. Of it I can't actually see. Can you raise what? your hand? I can hear you perfectly, but I can't She's, see. She's right to the left of the clock. Oh. 
Okay. <laughs> what varieties do you grow and what do you do with the crop? Okay, we have 19,000 apple trees <laughs> on 20 something acres of land. Uh, we've had an orchard there probably since the late 1780s and it became a commercial orchard under Elder John Coffin in the 17 I mean the 1850s. And so it's been growing there ever since. It's been renewed about five times because as those trees get older and need to be replaced, there's been usually a lot of new apples that have come in. So primarily now, uh, the largest crop we have are Honeycrisp, but we also have a fair and a good showing of uh, Cortlands and Macintosh, and we have a little bit of McGowan's too, and that's about it. So when I came to the community, well, you know how 20, I don't know if you know where we are, but that, so 26 goes right through the orchard now, or used to go through the village. Well, the most interesting apple trees we had were in the, that swatch. Oh. Well, that's all right. I, I'll trade anything for the peace and quiet of not having 26 in my door. Uh, so we, we still had, let's see, we had some red spies, northern spies, winter bananas. Um, we had an Oxford. We had a strawberry. So you took Rhode Island greenings we had up there, too. Really unusual heirloom apples. Mm. Well, they were, they were commercially viable when they were planted. The yeah. problem is by the time this was, the, the orchard was getting renewed right then anyways. Yeah. And they really weren't so popular anymore. Huh. But so, they and now. it is a commercial orchard. So we've leased it out since the 1950s. And we have as many apples as we need and want from them. And uh, then we get paid for the amount that they pick. I think there was a question right here as well. Sure. Oh, and Molly here too. Shakers have always been admired for their entrepreneurial efforts, such as the seed packets with the beautiful picture on the cover. Are there any new entrepreneurial efforts in the works? <laughs> well, <laughs> there always are. But since people who are from the village are here, I'm not allowed to talk about them because I always... They always call them my little uh, follies, but uh, <laughs> I'll just say this. Brother Andrew is, is formidable, and he is determined to, he's learned, uh, he's making candles and soaps now, so he's, he's really working on that strongly. Yes, can you tell me what you do about health care? And uh, second question, do you vote? Oh, oh, those good questions. ones. We have Anthem. <laughs> <laughs> and we vote. And you know, this, this, this is an interesting thing because Shakers have always voted. And, and, and yet many times the Shakers would tell newspaper people, oh, we don't vote. But we do, and we always have. But not in the way that we do today. So Shakers pay taxes. And so every town, when they had votes, Shakers were always there. Now, national elections, we didn't do anything with national elections until the 1960s. But um, we've always voted because we wanted to keep the taxes down in town. And I mean, presently, we're paying $40,000 to the town of um, New Gloucester every year for property taxes. Plus, we pay more for the town of Poland because it's one piece of property, but it's in uh, two. As Lenny likes to point out, it's in not only two towns, uh, two counties and two congressional districts. <laughs> so it's not a not nonprofit. We have a nonprofit, oh. but the Shaker Church is not a nonprofit. Okay. We heard about being entrepreneurs, and we've always been that. Okay. So that goes to another one, which I will get to. But voting. So we don't talk politics, though. Uh, Shakers have always Mother Ann, Father James, our founders, adamant, 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 adamant that it would bring in a party spirit, and that it is of this world, and it is not of Christ's kingdom, and anybody who held that position was not on solid ground. So we don't, and our friends are unfortunately very politically motivated, so it's sometimes hard to stop them from talking about these things, which we don't really want to hear about. I, I, and, but we do vote, but all of us vote our own conscience, how that goes. And the reason the Shakers started getting involved with voting was because in the 1960s, they really believed in the civil rights movement and needed to legislate, and they, needed, they felt their, their votes really did count. Yeah. So they needed to vote for people who they believed would help make a change. Now, so do you read the Portland Press-Herald? 
to get your information? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plant her there. Now, <laughs> well, you probably shouldn't have asked me. The other two shakers would have said absolutely. I've always been more fond of the Sun Journal. <laughs> They're better to us. They're better to us. I like local news. Um, but uh, what's non -profit? Non-profit? Oh, non-profit. Non -profit, yeah. So, Mother Ann said that the only way that we could really be legitimate was to pay our taxes. She uses the words of Christ as she often did. Jesus said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, render to God that which is God's. And the only way we could be citizens of the United States is pay our taxes like everybody else. Hmm. And she did not believe in churches having exemptions. So we've always paid our taxes. Huh. Unfortunately, I think it was short-sighted. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's just get another shout out question from the balcony and then is, I'll come uh, back. The Sheikh is considered a part of the historic uh, peace churches? Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot. Uh, historic it's, peace churches, like the Quakers, etc. Um, so the, the first Shakers were bitterly, bitterly persecuted, and uh, never did they retaliate, but rather just ask blessings of God and, you know, St. Stephen, they know not what they do and all of that. So. All right, I'm going to come to the back and work my way forward. Hi, thank you so much. You're both great. Uh, grew up Baptist, married to a Methodist pastor, go to an evangelical church that has 3,000 people on a Sunday morning, and wonder what you think of the fact that the only hope is if we stop calling ourselves all these things and just call out on the name of Jesus. Humans like to label, right? I mean, that's, it's us and them. And that's what it comes down to. And I think every denomination, at some point in its history or not, believed that they had the corner on divine light. And if you're not them, you're damned. And the only reason to have a new denomination is because you feel you have that light and you have that right. And I believe Shakerism certainly believed that in its first few decades of life but very early on just started believing in a universal appeal that people really have to find their own path and anything that is of God and it leads you in peace and in love is legitimate and everyone's on their own path. So I would say we agree with you, um, but boy, don't you have a lot of experience, <laughs> religiously speaking. <laughs> Thank you again for being here. My question is about the suffrage movement, and frankly, since then through today. I'm curious historically where the Shakers have been, and I'm curious where the three of your heads are, to the extent you discuss it apolitically, but more from what I would call a social justice perspective, or an equality perspective. Yeah, the, to the second two, indeed. Uh, so Shakers always have practiced the equality of all. And Mount Lebanon Shakers, the North family there, was particularly loved to stage stunts. Um, they were very socially active and at a time when Shakers frowned upon that in, intensely. But they were always doing it anyway. And Elder Zanna White was the one who was really, uh, she went out to vote and found out, what, I can't vote? I have full and equal rights in my community. You telling me I don't have full and equal rights in the larger community? So she caused a little scene. Um, but yeah, of course, the Shakers have all, the Shakers probably privately did a lot about in their belief in suffrage. Uh, the again, the North family was public about it. Everybody else was quiet uh, and just worked as they could work. And we've always believed in the equality of all. So we believe the genders are certainly as equal as anybody else. Everything is equal, and we treat people as they are. You know, and that's the way we believe we're called to be. And so everybody. No, I don't care what gender you are. I don't care what anything you are. Uh, if you're doing a job, everybody should be paid the same, obviously. Everybody deserves the right and the respect that you're supposed to be given. And that it isn't is a tragedy. And I think people just have to change their minds and get their minds around it and then start putting it into practice. And then things will change. And that's how it starts. As individuals and individuals joining together collectively and then the collective overcoming. Thank you. I've enjoyed this tremendously. 
but I have a little more personal interest. Do you, are you still in touch with your family? You said it took seven years before your father would talk to you. Mm -hmm. What about the rest of the family? Well, <clears throat> let's see. Mom was no more happy, uh, but she gave in much earlier because she needed me. So uh, she was fine. I, my mom is in the last stages of Alzheimer's, so that's that. Uh, my sister lives in Massachusetts, and she was just up actually helping up for the Christmas fair. And she comes, and she'll be back for Christmas, as a matter of fact. And my brother lives in Florida, and yeah, and my large—I don't have much of a larger family left anymore, which seems impossible to me. But uh, my cousin was just up from Florida with her husband, and so yay, they're still around. I think actually the funny thing is in Shakerism, when you join, you inherit these families that come with it. So uh, they all think of themselves as part of our family. And many of them come to be at Sabbath Day Lake for Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas and anything important. And usually come to visit and stay with us too during the summer or something. Molly, someone over here. This poor guy. He's, yes, been, he's asking, been asking, asking for and a And then Judy time. has too. This is probably a bad question, but have the shakers stopped shaking or what? Oh, yay. Oh, a long, long time ago. So that was a make fun term. Shakerism was founded in 1747 in Manchester, England, which was the second largest city in England, way up though. And they were very, very different from London. And that's where the hotbed of like, it, in this greater area, that's where the Quakers began, the first Swedenborgian chapel, the first Unitarian chapel, all these things were happening up there, far away from the ecclesiastical authorities. Methodism was hot, hot, hot. Um, and the first Methodists, you wouldn't know it today, but the first Methodists were very wild and woolly. And John Wesley was, he was not, he, he felt so strongly that it was the way of God that he couldn't stop it. His brother Charles, who was a high churchman, hated it. And so what happens is when Charles comes to take over the movement, basically, you have all these people leaving. And the Shakers were one of the groups, the Primitive Methodists, the Free Wesleyan Society. All these things come out because they want to, they want to maintain the authentic um, character of the church, which was the Holy Spirit descending upon them, very much what we would call Pentecostal today, and that's what the first Shakers were. Come to America with the fullness of that, and one of the most important converts they made was a man by the name of Joseph Meacham, and Father Joseph, as he was called, was tall and gangly, and he could never really labor very well, and worse than that, he was a Baptist minister. <laughs> Baptists don't put up with that stuff too much. Square order. Father Joseph was all about order. Order is heaven's first law. Everything was square. We couldn't have circles. We couldn't have triangles. We couldn't have rectangles. Everything was four square. And so it was under his leadership when he takes over the church in 1787, it dies out very quickly. And what happens is he introduces dance steps. And so everybody does the same thing at the same time, which he saw as a revelation of God and the angels were dancing over our heads doing the same thing, only better. And so he, these things evolve out into dances, which were lively and quick. And then they were placed in the 1840s as the community starts generally aging to stately marches. <laughs> and then the marches got devolved into the 1890s down to something called a walking march. <laughs> and so shortly thereafter, <laughs> gone. And um, so... The other parts of meeting are testimony and singing, and those parts have all stayed. So it's just the physical movement and worship that's gone. Although there are still songs that are done that are, have motions to them. You're welcome. I have a question in the back corner. Do you have any favorite sheep? <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, I actually have more than one, though. But uh, well, the two... Biggest troublemakers, uh, which are actually my favorite sheep, are Rose and June. There's little Shetlands, and they are constant worries and problems. They break out everywhere. They do everything horrible that you could possibly imagine. But they're so cute, you just forgive them. Michael won't forgive them, but I forgive them. I got it. Judy, 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 you've got to. Sorry. Very nice to see you tonight. Good to see you. It's been a long time. I just wanted. I just wanted.
just wanted you to tell a story about Sister Mildred because she has always been one of my favorites. Obviously. We know that, Judy. <laughs> We've always known that. Um, well, Sister Mildred uh, was born in 1897 in Providence, Rhode Island, and she, her father was gone, and her mother placed her with the Alfred Shakers in 1903. And so she was brought up at the second family at Alfred, and when that closed in 1918, consolidated with the church, she moved there, and then when that closed in 1931, she came to Sabbatay Lake. Although she always convinced us she wasn't there, she was just sort of on vacation. <laughs> and she never le Alfred never left her. And Sister Mildred uh, did many things in her life. Um, she was one of the most committed believers I have ever known. She had a great love of song. And Elders Harriet taught her thousands and thousands and thousands of songs. And she retained all of those in her mind. And she's the reason why we had a great revival of the Shaker spiritual, uh, which had really gone out of vogue in the communities after the 1880s and 90s, but had stayed strong at Alfred until 31. So that was one of the big things. She was caretaker for the girls. She was the candy maker. Uh, she was the trustee. And um, sister used to use her, her small diminutive stature and, and elderliness, much to her advantage. <laughs> uh, but she never, the only time she yelled is when a snake came and crossed her path. But you don't know the fear of God that this woman who is about four foot nine could put into you when she'd say, I want to see you for a minute. <laughs> and she'd call you over into the dairy, dairy cellar and make you feel about that tall for something you had done wrong. And, um, but she was very loving and caring, and she was a great mentor and a great leader. And she used to run the errands, and Judy ran Cook's hardware store down in, in Gray, where Sister would go. And Sister Frances was driving her at this point. And um, she, she said to Judy, Judy said, oh, I'm so glad to see you, sister. I haven't seen you in a while. I know, dear. This is the only place they let me go. <laughs> <laughs> she also won the National um, a Living Treasure Award from the Smithsonian. Wow. Mm -hmm. For preserving the Shaker spiritual. Huh. Th thank you so much. I, I, I had forgotten a bit of my family history. My, my eldest sister was a high school student at Greeley High School, and I believe brother Ted, Ted Johnson that's right. was an English teacher and then became a shaker. And I just would love to learn or hear more about brother Ted to the degree sure. you can share that. Absolutely. So um, actually, he was still a shaker. We were so financially poor because he was a teacher. He was out teaching so the community. As a shaker. Yay, as a shaker, which is really, really unusual and not something we, we encourage. And in fact, we finally got to the point where he could come home and be at the village all of the time. So Brother Ted was born. I can't, I can't do this without actually trying to sound like his father, Elmer C. Johnson. Um, I was waiting for my wife <laughs> to have my son. No, I won't bore you with that, but I can't, I can never get Elmer out of my mind. So anyways, he went out for coffee, because that's the kind of thing Elmer would do. And he came back and said, imagine my surprise. I came in to find out that I had a baby son. He was nine pounds and nine ounces. He was born at nine minutes past nine on the ninth day of the ninth month of 1930. Um, and that's how he was born. And he was brought up in uh, Watertown, Massachusetts. He came to Maine t uh, to Colby College, where he became a Fulbright Scholar and went over to the Sorbonne and then the University of Strasbourg, where he specialized in medieval languages, Latin in particular. And so he was a Latinist and knew Greek and actually knew seven languages. Then he was pursuing his master's degree at Harvard and he was working part-time in the Watertown Public Library as a librarian. And he was a cataloger, but he was filling at the reference desk, and this young woman in the 1950s did something very unusual. She was doing her degree in the Shakers. And so she was trying to get all these things through interlibrary loan, and he happened to, well, when he saw that, he said, wait a minute. And so every time a book came in, he read it before he gave it to her. <laughs> and on a day off, he went, he motored from Watertown across the street to Pittsfield to meet them, and 
he describes there was all these signs up, keep out, keep out, keep out, and he opened up the door and uh, the gate to go in the house. And out of the second story window came this booming voice, can't you read? It was Brother Ricardo. And he said, <laughs> and, and Brother said, yeah, I can, but um, I'm here to talk about Shakerism. And he said, wait a minute. And he came right down the stairs, took him up to his room, and Brother said, within minutes we were talking about the resurrection life. And he used to come back and visit Brother Ricardo and take him out to lunch and things like that. He would have these long conversations. Mm -hmm. And so he came up to Maine and uh, had a uh, librarianship at Waterville and started visiting. And because of the library, sister, he and Sister Mildred were the team extraordinaire. And he was as big and wide as she was small and thin. But they were the perfect team. And they worked together in such harmony. And so they got the library together, which was her great passion. And then he moved on to, to help the museum out. And he founded all that. He founded the Shaker Quarterly. He started bringing scholars in to start looking at Shakerism from many different aspects. Um, hosted conferences. He brought the farm back. He's the one who brought the sheep in. I remember the weekend he slipped the oxen in. <laughs> the sisters were supposed to be going away, and for some reason they didn't. And one of his students at Greeley, they had, they had the oxen, so they brought him up, and it hit the fan that day. <laughs> um, and so, and, and he was my elder, and he was my boss as well. And he was my mentor. And unfortunately, it was my job to find him dead. Mm. He um, died of a, uh, a virus that attacked his heart in the night in 1986. So we're still reeling from that. And, and frankly, the Shaker world is still trying to catch up to where he was in 1986 in terms of scholarship and understanding. So mm. it's still a loss we feel. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we just have time for two more questions. Um, why do you say yay and nay instead of yes and no? And do you ever go on vacation? <laughs> I haven't had a day off since 2007. <laughs> Not even when I have some horrible thing befall me. Um, we say yay and nay because King James Version, which is the version they were using at the time, Jesus says, swear not at all, you know, not by God above. Um, all of that, but he said, let your answers be a simple yay, yay, or nay, nay. We never use these and nows like the Quakers do, but we always use yay, nay. We call it the simplicity of language. Like, we're not supposed to use titles of the world either. Like, we're not supposed to use Mr., Miss, Ms., Doctor. The application we have for all of you is friend, because to us, you're all friends in that sense, the greater sense. Um, I'm curious. You said you were raised, I think, Methodist? Correct. And I'm wondering, I was raised Episcopalian, but I, I don't practice my religion in any way, shape, or form. And I'm wondering, was it a sort of traditional religious upbringing where you went to church on Sundays and went to Sunday school, but perhaps there wasn't much else to it? Or was it more of a devout kind of upbringing? Do you think that's what pushed you in the direction you went in. Thank you. Um, I was brought up very devoutly. My parents were both pretty, pretty earnest Christians, period. Uh, and we were brought up in Sunday school and youth group and all of that stuff. So, I mean, we were very involved in the church. That's the one thing about Methodism, or at least in my time, was it wasn't so much how much you could give on Sunday. It's how much you could be used in this committee and that committee and here and there and that. <laughs> and so my parents were very much involved. Uh, my, father, <laughs> my father had a dispute because when we became the United Methodist Church, he was furious by it and the reasons for it. And he just got angry at the church and wouldn't go back. But my mom stayed. And my father insisted that we all stayed until we were adults and could make that decision for ourselves. So, um, I th but more importantly, I think in, in our lives, the way my parents lived out their lives and their Christian values was the devotion to God and how we serve one another, which was a very Methodist kind of upbringing too. So that, that was the background of my life and why I think that I wanted to look for something in more practical terms. I don't think I was 
satisfied with the Sunday only kind of situation that it needed to be something that was nourished in a lot deeper sense that only community can actually provide. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's that, it for questions. Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Father Arnold. Thank you. Thank you.